right, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for coming to join us today again. Um, there's a there's something that comes up in a lot of conversations we have, uh, and we're going to dive deep into that today, which is don't eat bread, don't eat grain, uh, you know, get off carbs and starches. And we we understand the sugar and, you know, the crashes and the things we get, and we'll speak to the genetics of that. Uh, but then there's the innate grain. And what has happened to our food supply? What has happened to the agricultural business and how it's been industrialized? And I find there's no better person to speak to this than who we're really blessed to have on today, Dr. William Davis. So first of all, thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so you wrote the book, Wheat Belly, which a lot of listeners that we have here today have probably already been through uh, and maybe learned through, from that book uh, why it's such a threat. And it's unfortunate because this thing that maybe used to be beneficial for us is all of a sudden a big problem. Um, and one of the really cool things that you talk about that really opened my mind up was how the agricultural business just screwed up the plant. Like, <laughs> forget about everything else. The thing that we think we're eating isn't what it was anymore. You know, so let's dive into that because people don't understand the innate problem starting with the plant itself. Mm. You know, when the wheat belly first came out, it got dismissed by some as just another version of a low carb diet or just a way of saying go gluten free. And they missed a lot of the real essential points that, as you point out, agribusiness and genetics research introduced numerous changes into this plant. It doesn't even look the same. Instead of this four and a half or five foot tall uh, field of you know amber waves and all that, it's now an 18 inch tall, thick stalked, large seed, large seed head. It looks very different. And the appearance is different and it is very different. It's biochemically very different. And one of the things they did, for instance, they altered the gliadin protein. Gliadin is one of the components of gluten. Uh, right. Gluten is comprised of two parts, gliadin and glutenin. And it's glutenin that allows that stretchy uh, uh, pro property that allows someone to make a pizza crust, for instance. But it's the gliadin protein that's sourced a lot of the problems because humans don't have the digestive enzymes to break it down. And one of the striking effects of the gliadin protein that's only partially digested is that it yields opioids. But mm. they're opioids that don't make you high. They're opioids that stimulate appetite. So big food loves wheat because it increases human consumption, human spending, but it causes incessant hunger in those of us who consume wheat and grains. That's just one of the effects that was created by all the changes introduced by agribusiness. And it's funny because we, we see this evolution of industrialized food and everything seems to be getting bigger. The, the volume is important because that's how you make your money. Whereas this has sort of shrunk and down. So uh, isn't that giving them less yield? Isn't that counterproductive for these the profiteers? So uh, the changes were introduced into wheat uh, for good purposes. It was to increase yield per acre so that they could solve world hunger. This was a very noble project in 1950s, 1960s. The Rockefeller Foundation, the government of Mexico, the U.S. government, a variety of agencies pitched in money for a research effort east of Mexico City. And they succeeded in manipulating the genetics of these plants, mostly corn, wheat, and soy, and increase yield. For wheat, they increase yield per acre four to eight fold. So it really benefited the farmer. It really benefited starving people. That's why the main scientist, Dr. Norman Borlaug, won the Nobel Peace Prize for that work. But never in all these changes that were introduced into modern wheat to yield this very different looking thing, that, which is called a high yield semi-dwarf wheat, right. it was never asked, does this remain safe for human consumption? And so that question was never asked. It was just assumed to be the same and have no di different effects. Uh, but it, it got worse. Farmers and agribusiness scientists also chose strains of wheat that are enriched in two things, wheat germaglutinin and phytates, because they both exert potent pest-resistant properties. So your wheat plant doesn't get eaten by insects or molds. Mm. But the problem with that is, the enrichment of wheat germaglutinin means it's enriched in a very potent bowel toxin. Wheat germaglutinin is extremely toxic to the human gastrointestinal tract. Phytates are very effective at binding minerals, especially iron, zinc, magnesium, and calcium. And you poop it out. So anytime you have a bagel or pancakes or sandwich, a lot of the mineral nutrients 
are not absorbed. Uh, this is most striking wow. when you see um, iron deficiency anemia. I've seen it's mostly aff afflicts females for odd reasons, for unclear reasons. But I've seen ladies with hemoglobins in the anemic range of seven or eight, and they're breathless and cold and tired. They're getting iron supplements, iron injections, uh, blood cell transfusions, bone marrow biopsies, and it doesn't respond until they go wheat and grain free and they have a normal hemoglobin typically within two weeks. So uh, in other words, and there's some other problems too, but in other words, wheat has accumulated this whole long list of problems that really reflect, you can see it reflected now in people. Appetite stimulation, obesity, type 2 diabetes, mm. gastrointestinal complaints, acid reflux, uh, on and on and on. A lot of it is created by, uh, made worse, of course, by government advice, food plate, food pyramid, agencies like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, all agree you should cut your fat and eat more healthy whole grains. So, mm. <laughs> so the changes wow. introduced by agribusiness and genetics research, then amplified by predatory practices of food, of uh, big food companies, because they know that there's an appetite stimulating effect of modern wheat, and made worse by people who think they're doing good by telling you to eat more grains. Incredible. And you mentioned that food pyramid, and there's been a lot of noise in the last little while about the recent charts that are coming out where, you know, Lucky Charms and Cheerios are ranked higher than eggs and red beet. Uh, and I know in your work that the evidence is clear, you know, just listening to speak for a few minutes, reading your book and diving deeper, it's indisputable. How does this still stay siloed outside of, you know, conventional wisdom? Is it just lobbying? Like, how does this not become common knowledge? I fear it's so deeply entrenched into the thinking, the activities, the teachings, the research activities of so many people. It's going to take over a generation to change this. It's not going to change overnight. Uh, you know, when you devote, I've talked to these people many times. I've had debates with them. When you devote 30 years of your career to telling people to cut saturated fat, eat more healthy whole grains, everything in moderation, all the nonsense they say, it's hard to retract it. And there's liability. Imagine some an agency like the American Heart Association realizes and that they've made a mistake and not only didn't prevent heart disease, but actually caused heart disease. They actually made yeah. heart disease more likely with their advice. If they admit it, well, guess what? There's a big class action suit and all kinds of liabilities. And so we typically will not hear any kind of apologies. You know, when it was, back in the 1940s and 50s, when there were uh, ads uh, touting the how doctors thought that smoking camels were good for health, there never was a retraction or apology. So this is typical. We're not going to see a retraction or apology, even when the evidence is overwhelming that the, the, the conventional dietary advice is not only ineffective, it's destructive. Hmm. So you're talking, so we're talking about, you know, conventional wisdom of eat grains, et cetera, et cetera. Is there anything uh, is it is it true that what you're describing as that modern grain that was altered for the purposes of yield, the ignorance of, you know, not knowing that there was an alteration, was the previous grain or the ancestral grain actually healthy? Or was that, is grain in itself a problem? If we go back in time to the 19th century, Middle Ages, uh, the birth of Christ, back, 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 uh, Every strain of wheat becomes less and less harmful, but it never becomes harmless. Let's look at what happened to the first humans. And this is quite uh, well worked out. The first humans in the Middle East, about 12,000 years ago, who, because they were starving, there was some changes in climate, and they ran out of conventional sources of food, and they turned to desperate measures. In this case, they figured out that they could get wild wheat. So this is called uh, einkorn wheat. A 14 chromosome plant, by the way, compared to the 42 chromosome moderate high yield semi dwarf, right. completely different things. But einkorn wheat grew, grows wild, still does today in the Middle East. And it's testimony to human cleverness that they have figured out a way. You know, you can't eat the stalk, the leaves, the roots, the husk. You have to isolate each little seed. And they dried them in the sun and then crushed them with stones. 
and heated them in water in a stone bowl to make porridge. That was the first way to consume wheat. Now, so what happened to those people? This is true for wheat in the Middle East, the Levant. This is true for millet in sub-Saharan Africa. This is true for maize and teosinte in Central America, and to some degree true in the, uh, Southeast Asia with, with rice. What happened to those people? Uh, amazingly, prior to the consumption of grains, tooth decay was very rare. So 1% to 3% of all teeth recovered prior to the age of grain consumption showed decay, abscess for formation, misalignment, etc. When humans added grains, there was a huge uptick in tooth decay. 16 to 49% of all teeth showed decay, abscess formation, misalignment. This was a big problem. There was also a doubling of knee arthritis and the appearance of deficiencies, especially of iron. So, so even with those, with consumption of the most ancient form of wheat, there was still an explosion in in uh, disease. Now, with, with regards to the tooth decay, decay, the people before grains with almost no tooth decay, they didn't have toothbrushes or fluoridated mm. toothpaste or dental floss or dentists. The, the right. closest they got to yeah. an idea of oral hygiene is probably take a twig and use it as a toothpick. <laughs> That's about right. as far as they got. <laughs> Yet they had almost no tooth decay. And so we, of course, in the modern age, compensate for the uh, oral uh, deterioration of oral health with oral hygiene. We have to, but we're compensating for the uh, oral microbiome disrupting and tooth uh, dental de decay of grain consumption. That is and truly sugar. fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating because <clears throat> it's true. You see it. Um, and, and if you look at it, even, even in modern times, uh, if you go to different ethnic groups, um, and you look at dental health based on what they eat, you can actually see that. You can see it to some degree, right? Uh, which is really eye-opening. And so when you go, so we, we've been talking about the plant itself. And because you've looked at sort of the, the food complex and industrialization, then what you've told us about so far is above the ground, so the plant and how that's changed. If we go down and start to look into the soil, is that also a consideration in terms of why wheat is a problem and what's going on with the modern soil? Well, there's no doubt. I'm no soil expert, of course, uh, but uh, you're, there's no question that uh, modern farming has ruined soil. It's essentially dead with all the herbicides and pesticides. I can't say it's had a specific effect on, on wheat, but it is having an effect on food in general, as you know. You know, if, if soil is dead, soil should be like human, like the human gastrointestinal tract should be filled with healthy microbes. Right. Uh, and that's why organic farming and some, there are some efforts to restore a soil microbiome, but those are just in their infancy right now. So right now, modern mono, monoculture uh, farming is, you're, you're right, ruining the soil. And they're yeah. having to use more and more herbicides and pesticides like glyphosate the uh, right. active ingredient in Roundup, you know, glyphosate is an, is, is an uh, herbicide, but it's also an antibiotic. And so when humans consume anything, including wheat, where glyphosate is used as a desiccant to dry it out, uh, you get exposed to this antibiotic in substantial mm. quantities. And that introduces further changes in the uh, gastrointestinal microbiome. It's funny because the, the, the news and the information on glyphosate is sort of undeniable now. So you have this whisper of using the glyphosate that we all now agree is a problem to make the wheat and grain innocent because well, it was never the grain. It was, it was the glyphosate, right? So keep eating grain. And you're actually starting to hear that now because there's somebody else to point a finger at. <laughs> and it's incredible how far it can go. Uh, but so now going, so now somebody's consumed it. You've been on grain. You talked about, you know, it binding and eliminating and removing really required nutrients from your body before even getting there what's happening on in, in the gut because i've heard you talk about the gut microbiome in you know eloquent ways so what then happens to this flora that we have uh, and how is that affecting us so as we talked about there are components in wheat and grains that are very disruptive to the gastrointestinal tract like wheat germ gluten in it's extremely uh, destructive to the, to the um uh and 
gastrointestinal tract. It, it, it destroys the villi, the absorptive villi that line the intestines. The, the gliadin protein we know with good science increases intestinal permeability to gliadin and to other things like bacterial breakdown products. So grains, for a lot of reasons, are extremely inflammatory. And we know this with good science. But it's, it's, it's worse than that because we've been overexposed to antibiotics and other factors like chlorinated drinking water and uh, food additives like preservatives that kill microbes in food, but also in you. Uh, uh, other additives like emulsifying agents like polysorbate 80 and carboxymethylcellulose that uh, disrupt the mucus barrier and change the microbiome. A, a long list of things, including for many prescription drugs, change the human microbiome. One of the most important effects is that we've lost hundreds of species of bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract, many of which were important yeah. for health. And when you lose those supportive healthy microbes in the colon, fecal microbes like E. coli and Klebsiella and Cyprobacter and Campylobacter proliferate, but they do something very peculiar. They also ascend into the small intestine. The small intestine is not well equipped to deal with trillions of fecal microbes. Uh, you know, microbes only live for a few hours. So when you have trillions of microbes living in the small intestine, there's rapid turnover and they die and they release some of their components. One very important component is called uh, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin. We say LPS endotoxin. And because that small intestine is very poorly equipped to deal with fecal microbes, there's only a single layer of mucus barrier in the small bowel compared to a thicker two layer of mucus barrier in the colon where microbes are supposed to be. So when these microbes in the small bowel die, this LPS endotoxin is able to get into the bloodstream. And this, is, this explains now with good science how microbes in the GI tract can be experienced as something in the brain, like yeah. dementia or depression or in muscle and joints like fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis or on skin as rosacea or psoriasis or metabolically as... Uh, weight gain, type 2 diabetes, obesity, higher triglycerides, higher blood sugar, higher blood pressure, uh, fatty liver. In other words, the microbiome has become clear via this process called LPS endotoxemia has an impact on virtually all common chronic diseases aside from injury and infection. So it, it, it's causing all of us to, to look again at all human condi health conditions in light of this, of the involvement of the microbiome. Yeah, and, and the way you laid it out, it's a much more functional approach to gut health, meaning that there's a lot of people out there saying, let's map out your microbiome and understand what each strain and bacteria population means. And then should you be eating cucumbers or chickpeas, yes or no? You know, and that, that linear thinking maybe isn't going to help you so much. You're going to get these propensity-based answers of this thing kind of looks like it points to Alzheimer's, but we don't really know the functionality. But that what you just laid out in terms of a toxic, even not even the, the bac bacteria itself, but sometimes the excrement, the excrement, the byproduct of the bacteria, you know, that being toxic. Uh, and we've seen here in Canada, not far from us, it's a university called McGill in Montreal, where there's research being done on the layered approach to here's the flora, here's the outcome of the flora, and here's a disease. So it's not a direct, you know, uh, line from flora to problem. It's more like what is it happening with it? It's flourishing. It has a toxic excrement. Excrement it in itself is toxic, which then leads to inflammation. And if a woman also is estrogen toxic, for example, and already teetering on that edge of just barely making it, that's the thing that might push her over the edge. So that functional thinking is exactly what needs to be applied to gut microbiome health. But again, it comes back to why were you dysbiotic in the first place? Why were you out of order in the first place? Well, maybe it started with what you ate, right? Let's, let's start there. The very simplest thing, forget about all the science and what's going to happen. Eat well, forget about all this stuff. You shouldn't, it shouldn't happen, right? Uh, and, and what's really cool is your next book that's coming out. You've taken all this stuff and you've translated it into call it weight management, ideal weight, optimizing your storing your gut. Uh, and in fact, you use that language in the title uh, and essentially reprogramming the, the gut to get that weight goal. 
And so people don't think that here's the tool I need to focus on. So tell us a little about your thinking there and why you decided to write that book. You're exactly right. So based on European evidence uh, that was published in 2007, it's become clear that the microbiome, the gastrointestinal microbiome is responsible for, uh, it's a major driver of insulin resistance. That's the process that drives weight gain. It prevents weight loss. It, of course, underlies type 2 diabetes, heart disease, coronary disease, dementia, hypertension, and many, many other conditions. And so uh, the solution, of course, not give you a diuretic for hypertension or a statin drug for coronary risk. Those are silly ways to deal with this condition. What we do is we focus on the microbiome. Now, one of the great things that's emerged from my work is that uh, I ask, so if we have this problem of 30 feet of microbes inhabiting the entire GI tract, including the 24 feet of small bowel, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or we say SIBO, well, what if we take a probiotic, a commercial probiotic? Will it go away? Will it push back those fecal species? Not really. It might make things a little bit better, a little less bloating, but it won't get rid of the whole pro problem. So I asked this quite, these questions. What if we chose microbial species that are missing from the gastrointestinal microbiome because we've lost them? And what if we choose microbes that colonize the upper GI tract where all this occurs? And what if we choose microbes that produce what are called bactericins? These are natural antibiotics effective against those fecal microbes. So I chose three. I chose three strains of Lactobacillus rotari and Lactobacillus gasseri. Both of those colonize the upper GI tract. Rotari produces four bactericins. Gasseri produces seven bactericins. And I threw in Bacillus coagulans because it also produces bactericin. We ferment it using a prolonged method. Uh, most of these microbes double every two or three hours. They don't have sexual reproduction, right? They have asexual reproduction. Right. One microbe becomes two, two becomes four. So we ferment it for 36 hours to allow 12 or more doublings. We did flow cytometry on the yogurt. We call it yogurt. It's not yogurt. It looks and smells like yogurt. But we count up to 300 billion counts per half cup serving. People have been consuming this for four weeks. And so far of 40 people who've done this, this is just anecdote. 90% have converted to, uh, have gotten rid of their SIBO. We know that wow. because we have a new consumer device. I usually have it, but I just moved. I misplaced my device. <laughs> it's called the air device, little device. You blow into it. It talks to your smartphone on a scale of zero to 10. It tells you how much hydrogen gas microbes are making in your gastrointestinal tract. It's essentially a mapping device used properly, you can use it to map where microbes are. And I was skeptical at first when this thing first came out a few years ago. I thought SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I thought it was rare until we started testing people left and right. It's become clear it's everywhere. Yeah, It's so common. So that's incredible. And um, yeah, we see it over and over again. And people have no clue that's what's happening. You know, uh, they don't they don't go there. And this this is what really impresses me about the work you're doing, because as an MD, it's very hard to make that shift, given the toolkit that you're provided and given the work that you need to be doing every day. And when do you even stop to do this work? And when do you even, you know, take the time to think a different way and be more functional and then come up with the experiments as you have? Um, I understand from working with a lot of clinicians, that's not easy. You know, it, it takes your knowledge and combined with, uh, some pioneering of novel thinking to come up with what we actually need. And, you know, that's why we're all thankful for the book you just wrote. So what you just spoke of in terms of that protocol, like you came up with this, let's call it kimchi, this fermented uh, substance, right? Is this something people can do at home? Yeah. The only hassle is that you have to source the microbes from three different sources. When we right. play with microbes, we do have to be mindful of strain. So to illustrate, I've got E. coli. Your listeners have E. coli. But what if you ate lettuce contaminated by cow manure and E. coli? Well, you can die of that E. coli. Same species, right. E. coli, different strain. So we do have to, so the strains I use, the gas is the BNR17. For the rotari, it's the uh, uh, 6475. I'm sorry about these numbers. I don't make them up. Yeah, the, um, don't worry. 
<laughs> the Bacillus coagulans as a wacky designation. It's GBI 36086. But I tell you where to source them uh, because these are the strains we know have these, these uh, specific effects. Now, rotori can be also, you can cultivate these things uh, as a single microbe also. And that's, that was how I started doing this. I started to cultivate uh, lactobacillus rotori, the 6475 strain. It's sold as a commercial product at, at, by a Swedish company called BioGaia. And they sell it as a tablet called Gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S. But it's intended for infants because they have evidence to show that when babies get rotori, this strain of rotori, they have less colic. They have less regurgitation of, of breast milk or formula. So, you know, some kind of interesting effects. And yeah. then a group at MIT yeah. in Boston uh, uncovered a whole long list of interesting effects of restoring rotori in mice. They saw that skin healing was cut in half for a wound. They found that collagen deposition occurred extravagantly in the dermal layer of skin. They found that hair grew faster, that muscle, youthful muscle is restored, that youthful immunity is restored from the thymus gland. They found that testosterone was increased in the males. Uh, now, some of that has since been corroborated in humans. And so that we make yogurt with that strain, 6475. And I have thousands of people making that yogurt. And lo and behold, the effects seen in mice are we're witnessing now in humans. Now, we'll do clinical trials to further validate this. I want to know if there are other strains of rotori that are better or not so good for this effect. But right now, with the 6475 strain, we're seeing a reduction in skin wrinkles, increased skin moisture, uh, increase in muscle and strength, increase in testosterone, increased libido. Um, and a lot of this is by way of the hormone oxytocin. That is, the 6475 strain activates release of uh, the hormone oxytocin, the hormone of love and empathy. So right. people will tell you they like their partner more. They're closer to their families. They're closer to their neighbors and colleagues and coworkers. They're more generous. And my favorite, they're more tolerant of other people's opinions. So I got to believe, you know, we live in a time, of course, of putting aside pandemic issues, of record social isolation, record suicide, high divorce rate, can at least some of these social phenomena be due to the loss of lactobacillus roteri in the GI microbiome, thereby the loss of oxytocin? I think it is because we're seeing a lot of this reverse now. We're seeing people embrace community, get involved, go seek out the company of other people. And so I, I think what we're doing here is also having some kind of a social movement where people are becoming better, better human beings. That's truly beautiful. And I think in all of what you just said, you know, uh, people have to understand that it's not just, oh, something can get better. It's really reframing what your health potential is, you know, in our, our current reality today. And the prolific diseases that we see and 50% of people are expected to have a cardiovascular disease when at the turn of a century ago, it was a handful, truly, like it was a rarity, right? And now it's a, it's an, and it's an entitlement. It's expected to happen. Um, so what is actually health potential? The things you're describing and even what happened in those animal trials, um, that is what you're supposed to be doing if you're healthy, right? If you've treated your body properly and the food sourcing was proper and the stress levels are proper and the sleep levels are proper the level of health you can achieve both mental physical you know all of that stuff there's so much better than we could feel where we think we're at and the little that we're holding on to and trying to maintain we're already not in the right place there's we can elevate and so i just ask people to rethink how they even think about their potential it's not about wow these things that dr davis is saying i would love to improve this improve this improve this it's like, well, that's where you could have been. That's who you are, right? We're not, we're not talking about X-Men here and giving you a superpower, right? This is like bringing you back to what your potential really was in the beginning to, to begin with. So, uh, and the oxytocin example is incredible because we're seeing that over and over again, that uh, as people heal physically, they, as a byproduct, are healing mentally. So as metabolic health is reset, 
as hormone health is reset, you know, inflammation is brought down, fibrosis is eradicated, then all of a sudden systems start firing properly and neurochemicals, just like we said about health, are where they're supposed to be. The way, the way we feel isn't how we're supposed to feel. Our environment, our reality, our relationships and all that stuff are not the way they were supposed to be. We are not designed for this current today, you know, uh, new human experience, which really isn't that human. So let's just say that. So you, all of it gets better. The digestive process isn't just about breaking down food, it's about absorbing nutrients and eliminating waste. This is crucial for maintaining a healthy balance in your body and preventing chronic diseases. Our friends at Bioptimizers have a really powerful enzyme supplement that helps you digest your food better so you can get more out of it. It's called Mazimes. Mazimes takes your unique DNA into account by using the best enzymes active at a variety of pH levels to support your digestion throughout your entire digestive tract. Plus, it has Astrozyme, a blend of highly active systemic enzymes to help improve nutrient absorption and support a healthy gut microbiome. Experience optimal digestion the way your body is meant to. So go to bioptimizers.com, that's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com, and use the code DNAGO to get 10% off your order. So going back to food, just because you have so much knowledge here, um, we talked, we went deep into wheat, and I know that's where you spent a lot of time researching, and, researching and focusing. Are there other foods that have this extreme red flag to the degree of just don't eat it, like wheat? Sugar, of course, most people know that sugar is plain awful. It doesn't have right. the appetite stimulating uh, protein in it doesn't have uh, bowel toxicity, but it has all kinds of metabolic consequences and is a major contributor to heart disease. Um, I, I didn't mention the amylopectin A carbohydrate of wheat and grains is the reason why wheat and grains cause cardiovascular disease because the amylopectin A unique to wheat and grains is a very potent provocateur of the small LDL particle. You know, I, I, I'm shocked that people are still talking about cholesterol it yeah. should have been abandoned uh, decades ago. Uh, cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. It was meant to be an indirect and crude marker for the particles that cause heart disease. And, and we can measure those particles, but uh, big pharma makes so much money by focusing on cholesterol and developing drugs to reduce cholesterol. As you know, at least in the US, 80 million Americans take statin drugs, and there's been no reduction in heart disease at all. <laughs> they're still making $80 million additions of the hospital because heart disease yeah. is the number one moneymaker. So there's yeah. not a whole lot of incentive to stamp out heart disease. And in fact, we have people telling, right, cut your fat, cut your saturated fat, eat more healthy whole grains, a diet that causes heart disease via yeah. the small LDL particles. Small LDL particles are underappreciated as a major cause for cardiovascular disease. Small LDL particles are small. They're better able to penetrate arteries. They last five to seven days after having, say, a bagel or a sandwich uh, as compared to 24 hours for a large LDL particle. They're much more prone to oxidation, prone to glycation, glucose modification, and much more likely to uh, provoke inflammation in the arterial wall. So small LDL part are really bad. And the amylopectin A of grains is a major uh, factor in producing those small, as is sugar. Another one are, of all crazy things, ironically, gluten-free processed foods. Because yeah. gluten-free foods are made with corn starch, tapioca starch, potato starch, and rice flour. And those finely ground flours are also potent provokers of small LDL particles and high blood sugar. So people will say things like this. They don't read the book care like the Wheat Belly books carefully enough, or they think they know what it, what it, it says. They say things like, oh, I went gluten-free and I eat only <laughs> gluten-free foods like pancakes and waffles. And I gained 30 pounds and I'm now a type two diabetic. And yeah. so, <laughs> so those are problematic foods also. Yeah. <clears throat> Cardiovascular disease is really, it's so 
easy to prevent. It's the the thing that is, you know, if you pick one thing to lay out a roadmap and say, here's how you get it and here's how you don't get it. The paths are so clear. But like you said, we're talking about an $800 billion industry, you know, and that's pretty hard to turn on its head. And cholesterol is really the marker of inflammation. It's like your body's trying to fight inflammation right now. And it's probably endothelial inflammation uh, in that region. Your heart's fine, but the arteries are not. But that goes back to what you're talking about. You ate wrong and you breathed wrong. What 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 was what's in your environment? What are your stressors? What's your what does your sleep look like? The disease didn't just happen. Right? The disease is your body giving up after fifteen years of fighting your poor choices. And eventually the inflammation is at a level where too bad, you have cholesterolemia, you know? And that that's the same cholesterol that was trying to protect you, which now you're just keeping at bay with a pill. Uh, so the model is unbelievable, but like you said, highly profitable. You know, I can't think of any other eight hundred billion dollar problems that need to be solved. You know? <laughs> you know, I think that endotoxemia we talked about earlier is going. The, the preliminary evidence suggests that it is a very powerful cardiovascular risk factor, because when you have endotoxin floating around in your bloodstream, it inflames the arteries. And I think we're going. We're, unfortunately, take as you know, it takes a generation for practicing yeah. physicians to catch up to the science it takes 20 to 30 years. Cause right now, if you go to John Q primary care or even a gastroenterologist, certainly a cardiologist and say, Hey, um, I'm concerned about my gastrointestinal microbiome and its implications on my cardiovascular health or mental health or whatever. They're going to say, Oh, did you consult Dr. Google again? Or <laughs> don't waste my time. Or there's no such thing. Uh, despite the flood, the tidal wave of evidence coming at us uh, from the science community telling us, oh yeah, this is a big problem and it has major implications for human health. Yeah. And then you ask that same doctor where they get their medical care and they're paying an executive clinic tens of thousands of dollars to work on their gut microbiome and peptides and stem cells and you know, telling them what to eat, <laughs> going back to the <laughs> clinic to tell you, take this pill. So it's an unfortunate situation, but that they're also tied because they are at risk of losing their license for not following the script, right? So, so now, yeah, we talked about some other foods. Um, are there particular diets that, let the, the reverse, you know, a lot of people say that, okay, I was damaged by wheat and gluten and all these other things. Uh, I went carnivore and I feel amazing. You know, uh, some people say I went vegan and I felt good for six months and then I got sick. So it depends on what's going on genetically. We can, we dive into that every day in terms of the genes that affect certain metabolic pathways and drive enzyme activity, et cetera. But is there, what do you eat? What does your meal look like day to day? Well, you know, I was a vegetarian 30 years ago and I developed all kinds of health problems from it. I had triglycerides of 390, which is sky Ooh. high, HDL of 27. I had oodles of small LDL particles. I became a type two diabetic at hypertension. Uh, so I stopped being a vegetarian. All, all those things normalized. Uh, but it's clear if you want to be vegan or vegetarian, you got to take numerous supplements to compensate for the def deficiencies of your diet. You have to take vitamin B12. You'll never have a healthy level of omega-3 fatty acids in your body. You can't get it from linolenic acid like flaxseed. You have to take zinc. You have to take iron. Uh, you won't get any hyaluronic acid nor collagen. That sustains brain health, skin health, joint health. So you, you will be deficient in numerous uh, nutrients. Now, the other end, carniv carnivore diet or ketogenic diet, there's an upfront benefit. People say, oh, I lost 78 pounds. My waist shrunk. My blood pressure is normal. My triglycerides are, are way down, et cetera. But then about a year and a half in, it varies, 12 months, 18 months, they say, I'm constipated. And my triglycerides and blood sugar are going back up. My blood pressure is going back up. I've regained weight in my waist. What they did was they starved the, the, the microbes in their GI tract. Now, when you starve them, some, some species die. Some become inactive or quiescent. And then there are some microbes who thrive. One specifically is acromancia. The full name is acromancia mucinophila, mucinophila, mucus lover. So if you mm. feed acromancia, things like onions, garlic, and shallots, it thrives and does good things for you. Reduces blood sugar, keeps your, helps your sleep, gives you vivid dreams, reduces blood pressure. But if you starve it of those 
fibers from onions, shallots, garlic, etc. It starts to eat your intestinal mucus, mucinophila. And that is very bad. It can cause colitis. It can cause intestinal inflammation. It allows ready entry of microbial breakdown product like that endotoxin into the bloodstream. So people who follow those diets chronically have all kinds of problems, despite mm. the upfront wonderful effects. And so I do not advocate doing that. Uh, we are low carb, but we're not purposely ketogenic in a sustained way. There's nothing wrong with ketosis per se. It's not the ketosis that's bad. It's the starvation of microbes that happens. Species die, and then you have peculiar things happen. This is why, you know, ketogenic diets have used, been used for over a century for kids who have um, intractable grand mal seizures. So this question was asked, what happens to those kids uh, when they go on a ketogenic diet chronically? They stop growing. 8% of them develop kidney stones, which is odd for kids, right? They develop mm. osteoporosis, thinning of the bones as kids. Wow. Um, they have constipation. They have change in bowel flora, et cetera. So we know it's one of the best studied <laughs> diets there is. And we know that despite upfront benefits, it has long-term health implications. And it's, it's like that the carnivore diet, you know, all these stupid headlines, you know, red meat causes colon cancer, red, all that nonsense. There's a little bit of germ of truth in some of that, in that when you uh, follow these diets, whether it's keto, a ketogenic diet or carnivorous diet, you have a change in bile acid metabolism and you increase what are called secondary bile acids that are produced by microbes. And it's probably a cause for colon cancer. So, you know, diving into these diets, I, I'm, I've been accused of, of generating a fad diet also, but I hope I, what I, what one thing I do is I try to think clearly about what we're trying to do here and not just jump on some fad because it seems to sure. work for some short period of time. So, so we don't do that either. Uh, we do eat meat, fish. Uh, I hope you eat the skin, never cut off the fat, eat the fat. I, I'd love to see a return to organ meat consumption. You know, one of the, some of the deficiencies that modern people have are a lack of collagen intake and hyaluronic acid, because those things come from organs like the brain and the heart and tongue and liver. And so if we don't get high collagen and hyaluronic acid, we have accelerated aging of skin, of joints, of the brain. And so getting the best way to do that, of course, <clears throat> is to kill something. And eat his organs. <laughs> but most modern people don't want to do that. By the way, I, I had uh, lots of organ meats in Toronto <laughs> when I yeah, no was as there a few years ago. No kidding. I actually had a yeah, chef. Yeah. He, he actually made a three-course luncheon with each course some different organ meat. So it's a little easier to do in Toronto than it is in, in some other places. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that even that sourcing and getting... The right, um, you know, it, it's not always easy depending where you are, but it's easier than it's ever been for most people now, especially if you're anywhere in North America, you know, there's uh, things get shipped everywhere now. Um, but for sure, when people go carnivore, what does that actually mean? You know, the nose to tail, like I ate the animal, all of it versus I ate a chicken breast seven days a week, you know, so <laughs> protein and fat. That's, that's not truly the value or meaning. So there's, there's macros and micros you got to look at. And what are you getting from all the different parts of the animal? But like you said, even that is not enough. The gut requires the fiber and it requires, there's little secrets and pearls in each of these plants that we don't yet understand. And eating them in their natural state and the combination of things that come in them, you know, versus picking them apart. Um, there's miracles in all of these foods that we, we can't, we haven't yet understood because there's so much to know, you know. Uh, but the diet that you talked about, for example, in your upcoming book, just it's not really diet per se in terms of here's how you should eat. It's more like this is the therapeutic meal plan. This is we're, we're rethinking what therapy is. It's not wait to get sick and take a pill. Here's how to heal a couple of core systems in your body from which a lot of diseases come from. So you're you're talking about more food as therapy and doing the right things in terms of consumption, not for what gives you pleasure, not what, for, but you'll start to enjoy it eventually and it'll give you pleasure and not where it gives you pleasure, not for what gives you sort of that macro checkbox of I'm carnivore, I'm paleo, I'm vegan, but this thing is going to heal you. 
right? That's a very different approach to diet. You, you make a very good essential point. That is, I, I urge people to get away from thinking about treating things like treating high blood sugar, treating high blood pressure. Let's instead address, as you've just pointed out, let's address the factors in modern life that allow those conditions to emerge in the first place. And that's why if you do this and you have high blood pressure, your blood pressure becomes normal, but so do your triglycerides and your, and your mood and your headaches go away and your skin rashes go away. You've, you've addressed the underlying causes. And it also means reverting back to a living a lifestyle that is programmed into our genetic code. You know, if, if one of your listeners watched a lion tear open the stomach of a wildebeest and eat its liver and, and brain and, and heart and was disgusted and said, I'm going to lock that lion up and feed it kale and spinach. What's <laughs> going to happen to the lion? It's going to be dead yeah. in short order. Well, the same kind of dietary programming is programmed into our genetic code also. But we've, as modern people, managed to screw it up. But all we need to do is look at what primitive people did, hunter-gatherers, indigenous populations, and they kill animals. They eat all the organs. They eat the skin. They eat the intestinal tract. They also gather berries and dig in the dirt for roots and tubers. That's what we should be doing, though with modern counterparts, of course. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to make sure that people know how they can find the book. I know that Wheat Valley is out there. A lot of our listeners have probably already been through it and, and benefited from it greatly. Uh, the new book, I believe, is coming out February 1st. Is that correct? So it's actually out already. It's called Super Gut. It's in all major bookstores. I also have a busy website. It's called, I, I consolidated a lot of my, I had many websites and blogs and such. And so I consolidated everything to one. It's drdavisinfinitehealth.com. There's a blog there, very busy blog with over 2000 articles. There's a very busy discussion forum. There's a member only area called the inner circle where every once, typically once a week, we have a two way zoom like this. Me, typically we get about 80 people to show up and we talk about Rotary, the microbiome, SIBO yogurt, uh, diet, no. all these kinds of things you and I have been talking about. Uh, and we, as a way to give people support through the program. So drdavisinfinitehealth.com is, is where all the action is. That's brilliant. Amazing work you're doing. And thank you for continuing to put out this knowledge and continuing to write and continuing to learn and teach. And, you know, I, again, I know in your context, it's not an easy thing to do. Balancing the allopathic with all of what you're learning that's functional, uh, but it's a pleasure and honor. And thank you for being here today. Same here. Please continue doing what you're doing because media is blocking people like you and me. And so we have to resort to podcasts, blogs, social media, to get this message out. So please continue doing your great work too. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs>